In the criminal underworld, violence and murder are at the crux of power wielded by organized crime. These criminal organizations have multiple members who are willing and able to commit murder whenever it is deemed necessary. However, there are some men who become so skilled at the job of murder that their crimes become legendary. These killers are calculating, prolific, efficient, and know how to send a message. These killers are organized crime's top hitmen. Number 15. Machine Gun Jack McGurn Machine Gun Jack McGurn was born Vincenzo Antonio Gibaldi on July 2, 1902 in Licata, Sicily. The eldest son of Tommaso Gibaldi and Giuseppina Verderame Gibaldi, young Vincenzo emigrated with his mother and four siblings to join his father, who emigrated some time earlier and found work in New York City. At the age of four, Vincenzo and his mother left for the United States of America, arriving at Ellis Island on November 24, 1906. McGurn grew up in Red Hook, Brooklyn, where he went to Public School 46 on Union Street. In addition to the academic education he received in school, Vincenzo was also receiving a different education on the streets of Brooklyn, where the strong took from the weak, and in order to survive, you had to learn to fight. During the family's time in New York, Vincenzo's outlook on life was deeply affected when he learned of the death of his biological father, Tommaso Giobardi, at the hands of a local Irish gang in Brooklyn. The shooters, the story goes, mistook Tommaso for a member of rival Frankie Yale's gang. In this version, Vincenzo, now Jack McGurn, returned and killed the men responsible. Other writers claim Tommaso died of natural causes. Either way, the loss was a painful one, for Vincenzo and his family. The family would then move to Chicago in 1916, and while McGurn was still young, his mother Giuseppina would remarry to a grocer by the name of Angelo Di Moray. Di Moray and Vincenzo reportedly had a good relationship, and Di Moray would start and build up a grocery business in Chicago's Little Italy neighborhood. Meanwhile, boxing had become an outlet for young Vincenzo Giobaldi, and he had developed into a kid who was very good with his hands. During his adolescence, Vincenzo stayed away from street gangs and focused on his boxing. He would later take up a career in boxing as a teenager and would change his name to Battling Jack McGurn because boxers with Irish names seemed to get better bookings. It was as a boxer that Jack McGurn came to the attention of Al Capone and the outfit. While the newly christened Jack McGurn was learning the sweet science of boxing, his stepfather, Angelo DeMore, continued to build up his business. By this time, DeMore had begun selling sugar wholesale to the Jenna brothers, who ran one of the most powerful bootlegging gangs in Chicago. The Jennas reigned as a criminal organization that oversaw their own resident bootleggers, who ran hundreds of small stills making bad hooch at home with sugar. In 1923, after learning that Angelo also sold sugar to competing bootleggers, the Jennas ordered hitmen to shoot him down. On January 28, 1923, gunmen from the Jenna gang would murder Angelo DeMori. Gibardi, now known as McGurn, was extremely close to his stepfather Angelo DeMori. McGurn would avenge DeMori's death by tracking down and killing the three men responsible. Because the killers had publicly belittled his stepfather as a nickel and dimer, McGurn placed a nickel in each victim's hand leaving a coin in his victim's hands would later become the trademark of McGurn. The tracking down and killing of all three men came to Capone's attention, who admired McGurn's determination. It is possible that McGurn was already on the outfit's payroll as hired muscle due to Capone taking an interest in McGurn's budding boxing career. Either way, McGurn made the fateful decision to enter a life of crime after avenging his stepfather's murder. At first, McGurn was a member of the circus gang which operated under Capone and was led by Claude Screwy Moore Maddox. However, it wasn't long before McGurn became a trusted bodyguard and enforcer for Capone. With the Beer Wars conflict for the liquor business in Chicago in full swing, Capone had McGurn go after the O'Donnell gang for undercutting beer prices. McGurn, armed with a Thompson machine gun, took part in an attack that killed two O'Donnell members and unexpectedly a civilian as well. 
The civilian was well-known Illinois state attorney William McSwiggin, whose death triggered a massive scandal in the press. Capone, McGurn, and Nitty were forced to lay low outside of Chicago for months. However, the attack did achieve its purpose, driving the O'Donnells out of the beer business. Another problem Capone had was his ongoing feud with the Northside Gang. Capone and his boss at the time, Johnny Torrio, called in the help of another longtime friend from New York, hitman Frankie Yale. Yale then took out the leader of the gang, Dean O'Banion, by shooting him in his flower shop. The murder of their leader only infuriated the gang more, and soon the new leader of the gang, Jaime Weiss, struck back at his rivals. On January 12, 1925, Weiss, Bugs Moran, and Vincent Drucci attempted to kill Torrio's lieutenant, Al Capone, at a Chicago Southside restaurant. Firing at Capone's car, the men wounded chauffeur Sylvester Barton, but missed Capone entirely. Capone, unnerved by the shooting, ordered his famous armored car to be created. Moran then decided to kidnap one of Capone's trusted bodyguards, torturing him for information before finally executing him and dumping the body. On January 24th, shortly after the assassination attempt on Capone had taken place, Weiss, Moran, and Drucci ambushed Torrio as he returned from shopping with his wife. Both Torrio and his chauffeur, Robert Barton, were wounded several times. As Moran was about to kill Torrio, the gun misfired. The gang members were forced to flee the scene as police arrived, and after narrowly surviving this attack, Torrio decided he wanted out. After serving time on bootlegging charges, Torrio retired to Italy, passing leadership of the Chicago outfit to Al Capone. With the Northside gang at the height of its power and the outfit on the defensive, Capone needed someone to step up. In 1926, on Capone's command, McGurn and Nitty formed a hit team to take down Weiss. They waited in a room overlooking the gang's flower shop hangout, once owned by Dean O'Banion. As Weiss walked out of the flower shop, McGurn aimed his Thompson through the window and blasted Weiss with a fusillade of 45 caliber bullets. Weiss fell, mortally wounded. McGurn sprayed bullets that also killed Patty Murray and seriously wounded three other prominent Northsiders. After dispatching Weiss, McGurn became Al Capone's go-to hitman. Next on Capone's list was Jack Zuta, a racketeer and one-time outfit member who left to join the Northside gang and their new boss, Bugs Moran. McGurn threw bombs from speeding cars to intimidate Zuta, starting a brief exchange of bombings between the two of them. Early in 1928, Zuta went on the offensive, hiring hitman Isidore Goldberg to kill McGurn. However, McGurn got wind of his would-be assassin and would ambush Goldberg instead, shooting him and killing him. The Moran gang then assigned the heavily armed Gusenberg brothers, Frank and Peter, to get McGurn. The brothers one with a Thompson and the other with a 45 automatic pistol, fired a series of shots that badly wounded McGurn after he entered a smoke shop at the McCormick Hotel. The brothers figured it was the end for McGurn, but despite being shot in the chest, he survived after undergoing emergency surgery. McGurn recognized the Goosenbergs as the shooters. Chicago police asked him who did it, and McGurn would state from his hospital bed, without revealing names, Of course I know who shot me. When I'm well again, I'll settle this thing myself. Less than six weeks later, in April of 1928, with McGurn just out of the hospital, the Goosenbergs tried again. The brothers pulled up beside McGurn's car on a quiet Chicago street and unleashed a barrage of bullets. As their slugs whizzed by, McGurn leapt from the car for refuge next to a building. The brothers continued to fire at their target, however, fortunately for McGurn, None of the bullets found their mark. McGurn, remarkably unscathed, again knew exactly who his assassins were. McGurn was determined to make Moran and the Northsiders pay. He and Capone had devised an elaborate plot to take out a number of Capone's enemies at one time. At 10.30 in the morning on Thursday, February 14, 1929, which happened to be Valentine's Day, Seven men were murdered at the garage at 2122 North Clark Street in the Lincoln Park neighborhood of Chicago's north side. They were shot by four men using weapons that included two Thompson submachine guns. Two of the shooters were wearing police uniforms, while the others wore suits, ties, and overcoats. Witnesses saw the men in police uniforms leading the other men at gunpoint out of the garage 
after the shooting. The victims included five members of George Bugs Moran's Northside Gang, Moran's second-in-command and brother-in-law, Albert Kachelik, also known as James Clark, was killed along with Adam Heyer, the gang's bookkeeper and business manager, Albert Weinshank, who managed several cleaning and drying operations for Moran, and gang enforcers Frank Gusenberg and Peter Gusenberg. Two associates were also shot, Reinhard Schweimer, a former optician turned gambler and gang associate, and John May, an occasional mechanic for the Moran gang. Chicago police arrived at the scene to find that victim Frank Gusenberg was still alive, despite having sustained 14 bullet wounds. He was taken to the hospital, where doctors stabilized him for a short time, and police tried to question him. When the police asked him who did it, he reportedly replied, I won't talk. For God's sakes, get me to a hospital. He died three hours later. The massacre was an obvious attempt to eliminate Bugs Moran, head of the Northside Gang. Al Capone, who was at his Florida home at the time, was widely assumed by law enforcement and the press to have been responsible for ordering the massacre. Moran was the last survivor of the Northside gunman. His succession had come about because his similarly aggressive predecessors, Jaime Weiss and Vincent Drucci, had been killed in the violence that followed the murder of their original leader, Dino Banyan. The Valentine's Day massacre set off a public outcry which posed a problem for all mob bosses. Within days, Capone received a summons to testify before a Chicago grand jury on charges of federal prohibition violations, but he had said he was too unwell to attend. Based on his infamy, police set on McGurn right away as a suspect, but McGurn's wife, Louise Rolfe, swore to police that she was with him in bed to the point of suggesting that they had had sex on the 14th. For her story, the press named the beautiful flapper as McGurn's blonde alibi. Police arrested McGurn anyway, and prosecutors filed charges against him. But weeks later, lacking evidence, they withdrew the case. McGurn's shrewd operation worked, and it decimated Moran's gang, even though his real target, Moran, missed being killed with the others. While authorities two years later traced two Tommy guns in Burke's possession to bullets taken from victims, no one was ever convicted in the slayings. As his fortunes grew, McGurn purchased part ownership of a speakeasy, the infamous Green Mill at 4802 North Broadway. The club, still in operation today, was located in the middle of Capone gang rival George Bugs Moran's territory. Just how violent McGurn could be was made evident in November 1927 when a club manager, Danny Cohen, gave McGurn money to persuade comedian singer Joe E. Lewis, one of Chicago's top performers, not to move his act south to the rival New Rendezvous Cafe situated at North Clark Street and West Diversity Parkway. When Lewis refused, McGurn simply slit Lewis's throat and cut off a portion of his tongue. Left for dead, Lewis miraculously recovered and eventually resumed his career. However, according to many, his voice never sounded the same after the assault. McGurn continued his work for the outfit throughout the latter part of the decade. On September 5, 1929, gangsters Ed Westcott and Frank Crowley were found murdered in a Chicago suburb. Then on December 12, 1930, both Sam and his brother Rudolph Marino were shot gangland style and killed. All four victims had buffalo nickels placed in their palm, a calling card of McGurn's. Things would begin to change for McGurn when law enforcement began to close in on Al Capone. Then, in April 1930, when Frank J. Loesch, chairman of the Chicago Crime Commission, compiled his public enemies list of the top 28 people he saw as corrupting Chicago, McGurn's name was fourth on the list, with his boss Capone in the number one spot. This list was published nationwide. This notoriety caused him to be shunned by the new outfit bosses, as Capone had stepped aside to fight his court cases. Capone would be convicted on five counts of income tax evasion on October 17, 1931, and was sentenced a week later to 11 years in federal prison, fined $50,000 plus $7,692 in court costs, and was held liable for $215,000 plus interest due on his back taxes. This put McGurn completely on the outs with the Chicago mob. McGurn attempted to land on his feet when, 
As a lifelong golfer, he attempted a career as a professional. McGurn was a silent partner in the Evergreen Golf Course at 91st Street and Western Avenue, which was a known mob hangout where he could often be found playing, practicing, giving lessons, or drinking and playing cards in the clubhouse. Dan Lilly was known to have caddied for him once and claimed that he kept a machine gun in his golf bag at all times. FBI documents released in December 1999 revealed that singer Bing Crosby, who frequently played golf in Chicago, was one of McGurn's golfing partners. On August 25, 1933, the Western Open Golf Championship began at Olympia Fields Country Club in the far south suburb of Olympia Fields. A reasonably skilled golfer and flashy dresser, McGurn entered the competition as Vincent Gibaldi, another version of his real name. In the opening round, McGurn carted a 13 over 83 on course number 4, today's north course. The next morning, the name Gibaldi on the day's pairing sheet was observed by an alert Chicago police chief detective who sent two sergeants to arrest him. Aware of McGurn's truculent temper, the Chicago Tribune account reported, the sergeants enlisted the help of Lieutenant Frank McGillan and five policemen from the Homewood Station of the County Highway Force. McGurn was playing much better the second day until the group of burly officers accosted McGurn on the 7th Green and told him he was under arrest on a warrant issued the day before under the criminal reputation law. He was accompanied by his wife, the glitzy blonde alibi, Louise Rolf. Wearing a tight, thin white dress and sporting a bad attitude, she approached the policeman and snapped, Whose brilliant idea was this? McGurn, however, politely asked to finish his round. Amused, the plainclothesman agreed and became part of his gallery. But the police presence began to unnerve McGurn and his game suddenly went sour. He came in with a 16 over par 86 for a 36 hole total of 169, missing the cut by 14 strokes. McGurn would get six months in jail under the new law. Less than three years later on February 15, 1936, McGurn, by then impoverished and abandoned by his fellow gangsters, was assassinated by three men using machine guns. The shooting took place while McGurn was bowling at the second floor Avenue Recreation Bowling Alley at 805 North Milwaukee Avenue. He was buried in Mount Carmel Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois, the same cemetery that contains Dion O'Banion, Earl Jaime Weiss, Frank Nitti, Al Capone, and several other gangsters from various eras. Although the identity of McGurn's killers remains unknown, research and speculation by criminologists suggest two possible theories for the killing. One, he was killed as revenge by George Bugs Moran for McGurn's alleged part in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Or two, the Southside mob under Frank Nitti, who took over after Capone was sent to prison, had killed him because McGurn, who by this time was a heavy drinker and braggart, had become a liability because of his intimate knowledge of the gang's extensive operations. As a final insult, the killers pressed a nickel into the palm of his left hand and put a valentine card with this poem written in his right hand. You've lost your job, you've lost your dough, your jewels and cars and handsome house, but things could still be worse, you know, at least you haven't lost your trousers. Machine Gun Jack McGurn was responsible for at least 22 murders and probably numerous unknown killings. He was one of the first to utilize automobiles in performing hits, even having thrown bombs from a moving vehicle. In the perilous era that was the underworld of Chicago in the 1920s, McGurn was Capone's number one hitman and possibly the most feared man in a city full of feared men. He was without a doubt one of the top hitmen in the history of organized crime.